The Helio was the brainchild of the brilliant Dr. Otto Koppen, who headed up aeronautical design at MIT for many years. In fact, Dr. Koppen was a member of the staff at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for some 40 years. Now, we're privileged to have him with us at the JARS Center, now 86 years old, flying his little Grumman Tiger on what he says is his swan flight, his swan song around the United States. And he's come to visit us and uh, tell us a little bit uh, of the background and how the Helio came to be and uh, talking about slow flight and some of its problems and answering questions. So it's a real pleasure to present to you Dr. Otto Koppen. We had a, uh, a meet in Boston in 1910 it was timed by a famed Harvard astronomer, and we had a race, uh, a low-speed race. And the one right airplane did 18.6 miles an hour in its closed course, and another one did 21. So the low speed is not a completely new idea, except that if you're going to have a low-speed airplane, if it's going to be of any use to anybody, it's got to have some high speed also. So. Uh, I can tell you in a nutshell what the design objective is in any of them, and that's this. You want the biggest ratio of maximum lift coefficient to minimum drag coefficient. In other words, the greatest lift for the least drag. Now, people get confused about that with low-speed airplanes. You walk down the line of airplanes, and you can always pick out the one they call stole because it's the dirtiest airplane aerodynamically on the line. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. It's low speed, uh, drag doesn't matter. This is wrong. Uh, drag is just as important on an STOL as it is on uh, uh, any other airplane. Uh, so I'll get that off my chest. That's a bugaboo for me. <laughs> uh, now, <coughs> uh, I, I designed low speed airplanes. I want to start out with a a very early one for, for a reason. Uh, when I was a young man, and I was young once, uh, I, I worked for the Ford Motor Company and had the uh, job of designing uh, a, a small light airplane. They call it the Flivver. And uh, uh, being a bright and young and just out of college, uh, I, I knew all the answers, of course. And uh, this airplane had a very nice, peculiar aileron system. In order to avoid uh, the separate uh, amount of work you have to crank the flaps down, I had an arrangement whereby you had full span ailerons, which also were the flaps, and which uh, were actuated by a little gearbox. Working for the Ford Company, you could get anything like that. A uh, little gearbox, which consisted of a a bevel gear attached to the bottom of the stick, and that engaged two bevel gears on torque tubes to the ailerons, or the flaps, so that when you move the stick sidewise, you rotate one gear up and one gear down, which did the aileron motion. Then, in addition to that, the whole casting was on a, a bearing, so that when you pull the stick back, both ailerons went down. Gee, it looked beautiful to me. And as far as the pitching, the pitch one, it worked fine. Uh, when you uh, came in to land, pull the stick back, uh, increase the angle of attack of the airplane, also pull the flaps down, so you get uh, an, an increase in angle of attack of the basic wing, plus the uh, increase in angle of attack you get due to the flaps. Worked very well. But one day, it was taking off out of the backyard, uh, and that <laughs> should be reminiscent to you helio people, taking off uh, out of the backyard next to uh, the shed of uh, Mr. Ford's uh, railroad cars, a shed about 100 feet long. And the pilot taking off alongside the shed, nothing to it, you know. And when he got to the end, he hit a, uh, a crosswind gust. And using the ailerons, and remember now, the flaps were down with the stick fairly well back, and the ailerons were drooped. And when he moved them, the thing headed straight for the shed. And he just missed it over the top. 
uh, th those, that system disappeared right then and there. <laughs> it became uh, a fixed wing trailing edge and uh, ordinary ailerons. Now the reason I, I bring this up is this. This was a part of the story of the, the progress of the development of the, of the Helio. Um, now that airplane was a stole airplane. We used to back the tail against the hangar door and it was off at the, at the ramp. It was a, a stole airplane by virtue of the very light wing loading. And uh, by, by luck, by accident, it had my magic formula for the prop, which I also designed. My magic formula is, if you take the prop diameter in feet, square it, and, and divide by the horsepower, the answer should be close to one. It had a six foot prop and a 35 horsepower engine, so 36 over 35 is very close to one. And this gives you very excellent conditions for, for takeoff. Now, uh, going from that uh, to the Helio, when uh, I laid down the design or started of the design of the Helio, there were three of us, get back a little history, uh, a, a Mr. Reinstrom, who was a, a vice president of American Airlines, uh, Lynn Bollinger, who was a, a professor at the Harvard Business School, and I, each uh, put up $6,000, for a total of 18000 And with it, we bought the cabin section of a Cub Vagabond and, and the wing panels of, of the same airplane and some other parts, probably some control parts and so on. Not the landing gear, not the tail. Not the tail because I lengthened the fuselage by four feet. Oh yes, we bought the horizontal tail, but not the vertical tail. I lengthened the fuselage by four feet. Now, uh, <coughs> and uh, we took that airplane and uh, moved the landing gear forward. I'll tell you why in a minute. And, uh, I eyeballed the leading edge slats. We had no wind tunnel tests. I eyeballed them and, uh, and had full span flaps. And uh, having burnt my fingers once, uh, I was still smarter now. I was a professor. And uh, I said, uh, well, uh, we know how to do it now. So uh, the rudder was divided uh, uh, horizontally. The bottom half of the rudder was given to the pilot, as conventional, but the top half of the rudder was uh, connected to the aileron system of our right brothers. In other words, when you, uh, when you applied left aileron, you got some left rudder. Uh, the idea of that being to counteract the uh, adverse yaw. Uh, and uh, it wasn't as quite as simple as that. We had a device in the roof called the brain, so that when you crank the flaps down, and you're familiar with that crank handle, you soon will be. Uh, when you crank the flaps down, uh, the uh, moment arm, the arm of the actuating member in the roof of the cabin, uh, gave you a larger and larger uh, a radius, so that as you crank the flaps down, you've got a greater and greater rudder angle for a given aileron angle. You understand? So that uh, when the ailerons <coughs> were fully down, or the flaps rather were fully down, same thing, flap and aileron, just one, uh, you got the full rudder with full aileron to counteract the aileron yaw. Now, uh, aileron yaw, let me say something about that, it is a kind of a nasty thing. Uh, you have all heard about induced drag. That is the drag due to the due to lift. The higher the lift, the higher the induced drag. And of course, when you take an aileron and put it down, it's nothing more than a flap, and uh, it increases the lift and increases the drag. And of course, the increase in drag out there gives you an increase in yawing moment in the wrong direction, naturally. always You can always be right if you add up all the moments in the wrong direction, adverse they're always adverse, uh, so you can, can't be wrong. At least I used to tell my students that. Now, uh, we uh, uh, had this ideal arrangement that calculated beautifully uh, 
the, the, the airplane made perfect turns on, on the drafting board. Uh, <laughs> but when we flew it, it didn't turn at all. <laughs> the, the adverse yaw still uh, just defeated that thing. We only flew it a couple of times, and that, that's that. And uh, we, uh, the brain, I think, is still up there, uh, but inactive. And <laughs> like some, like some of the laws, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the NACA previously had done, done experiments on spoilers for ailerons. Uh, this was just a flap hung on the on the spar uh, between the, uh, uh, the the rear spar and the uh, trailing edge uh, of the main wing, and uh, just had a simple wire on it and a spring for return, and when you move six sideways, you pull one up or the other, never both. And uh, that worked all right. Uh, he had enough moment, he could fly the airplane and so on, worked all right. But uh, when you have a device like that, uh, somehow when you first break it from the surface, the flow doesn't believe you and goes right around it. You see, the, the purpose of these, uh, this uh, flat back grab is to separate the flow. But if it doesn't believe and goes right around it, you get no change in lift. So when you first move the stick, nothing happens. You sit and wait, and, and you get annoyed, and you give it a good shot, and wham, uh, it happens. So it's, it's a, a nasty kind of control. Uh, the uh, the uh, Japanese airplane, the MU-2, has full span flaps and, and uh, spoilers. And I've talked to the pilots of it, and they say, yeah, that's the way it is. Uh, and it's, it's a nasty kind of control. And we were not satisfied with it. So we uh, went to uh, the interceptor. This uh, was an English invention. You understand, none of the uh, devices, or even, I guess, the ideas on the airplane are mine. I just pick them here, there, and everywhere and try to get the best combination to get the best design. It's, it's not an invention. Uh, now, the, the interceptor uh, only operates in conjunction with the leading edge slat. Uh, you know, when the slats are out, your pilots may, sh may shudder at this now, those little brackets that hold the slats take 64% of the weight of the airplane. In other words, 64% of the lift of the wing is on those slats. So, <laughs> so we, we never had any trouble with it. <laughs> so, but with 64% of the lift uh, on the slat, if uh, you do something to block the flow behind it so you don't get the high velocity flow between the slat and the wing. And this is what the interceptor does, it blocks that flow. Uh, the 64% that on that portion of the slat disappears. And boy, this gives you a real rolling moment, as those of you who've flown it know. And uh, when we had that system, we, uh, we were satisfied. And there's no lag to it. Uh, we had to... Uh, um, set the uh, interceptors down below the surface. We had first had them set flush for the surface, and they fly along in bumpy air, and they bounce in and out due to the flexibility in the control system, and the airplane would, would, would do it. They, they showed absolutely no lag. So uh, we, we, I don't know if they still do it or not, but we put them down below the surface of the wing so they can bounce a little bit without coming out. So uh, we decided. Uh, at that time, that uh, my, f my Harvard friends being highfalutin, they called the airplane the, the proof of concept. <laughs> that was the proof of the Helio concept that built that airplane, except for the propeller. Uh, so we were satisfied. We had, aerodynamically, we had what we wanted. Oh, well, let me say something about the landing gear. Uh, the, the landing gear uh, was a pneumatic strut and uh, uh, a very small diameter had a high uh, pressure uh, ratio, uh, high pressure variation. And even uh, with chocks, if you open the throttle, 
the nose would start coming up, not because of the lift, but because the pneumatic struts would, would expand. And uh, it was fun taking it off, no matter what you did with a stick. You uh, open the throttle and up would come the nose and say, boy, that's beautiful, it takes right off. But it wasn't. <laughs> so uh, the next thing uh, was the propeller. Now, if you have an, an airplane with a, with a large speed range, and uh, we have something like five, uh, it, it's impossible to do it with a fixed pitch propeller. And none of the engines we contemplated using were fixed up for variable speed propellers. No way to adjust the pitch of the propeller. But there was one propeller called the Aromatic. I don't know whether any of you know about it, which was sort of a, I have another adjective, but the ladies present, I won't say it. Uh, uh, it, it approximated a, a constant speed propeller pretty well. Automatically, when the thrust was high, the pitch was low, and when the thrust became lower, that's the speed built up, why the pitch increased. And uh, on this 85 horsepower Continental, we had a nine foot diameter propeller. My ratio again, you know, nine squared, 81, 81, 85. And uh, uh, I calculated it to take off in a in 100 feet. And lo and behold, uh, I was wrong. It was 125 feet. And uh, the whole department was wondering about that at MIT. And one of my fluid dynamics friends says, you know why? Uh, you engineers are always use steady state coefficients. Because you, you take a model and put it in a wind tunnel, the wind tunnel's running at a constant speed, and you measure something. And you say, that's the lift coefficient. But when the airplane is, is taking off, it's, it's accelerating rapidly through its takeoff speed, and the wing circulation you get then is a wing circulation it had some earlier speed. So that uh, while accelerating, it would never uh, generate the same lift coefficient as it would uh, with a stationary, with a constant flow. So, uh, well, at least except at 125 feet. <laughs> now, uh, it wasn't easy to swing uh, a, a nine-foot propeller on a little airplane. Uh, the, the regulation in those days was, and probably still is, that with the airplane level and the, the uh, shock absorbed squashed all the way down, it had to have nine inches of clearance with the, with the prop vertical. And uh, it had minus one and a half inches. <laughs> so so uh, I called the FAA, or CA then, and uh, told them about it, and I said it was all right, it was safe. They, <laughs> they very tongue-in-cheek said, if you can prove it's safe, uh, we'll buy it. And they sent four test pilots up, not one, but four, and, and they were trying to outdo it themselves to get this propeller. And you know what I mean by getting it. That, uh, now, when the airplane was off the ground, no load on the wheels, uh, the wheels <coughs> got a foot. You see, the foot uh, traveled in the shock absorber. And, uh, uh, and the gear was very far forward. And uh, with that uh, uh, expansion due to the uh, uh, compression of the air and the strut, you'd, you'd open the throttle and stick hard forward and it would take off. And the one thing you knew about the tail didn't come up. The tail wheel always was last to get off the ground. Uh, I can tell you a story about that later. Uh, and uh, so they came, and they, were, they, they tried. Oh, they tried. And tried to, each tried to outdo the other. They'd come in, tail high, and and make a king-sized aerodynamic bounce. You know, they hit the ground with the gear far forward, the tail would whip down, and they'd, uh, next time they'd hit the ground, could hit the ground, was off the end of the runway. <laughs> so there was no luck that way. Uh, and uh, they, they simply tried everything. Uh, tried uh, raising the, and running with the fuselage level. Couldn't do that because the struts were expanded by then, and. And there they were. 
So finally they said, if uh, we can make it that way, we'll buy it. So that uh, ended the clearance problem. And that's why the fourth place, which does not have this uh, uh, propeller problem, uh, has the gear so far forward. Uh, the company, maybe the pilots like it. You can land with the brakes on, and it doesn't raise the tail, and so on, that sort of thing. But without the casting wheels, it's a ground looping fool, isn't it? <laughs> Makes your head swim. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, uh, now we thought we all fixed. This is a proof of concept. We've got the aerodynamics, we've got the propulsion, all set. So we got Continental to build a, a, a 145, a six cylinder 145 horsepower engine with a V-belt drive for this uh, four place airplane. The, the, this is now the real prototype. The other one is what we call a proof of concept, but the next one was a real prototype for the airplane you know. And, and it is 145 horsepower and it's gonna have 11 foot diameter propeller. I was getting a little scary. I didn't quite stick to my ratio of one, you know, 121 <laughs> over 145. But it was a big propeller. And it would take off just like the two place. You open the throttle and whoosh. And uh, one day the test pilot was flying it, not too long after we first flew it. And coming in in a glide, fast glide, I think it was, the propeller suddenly went into flat pitch and he almost went through the windshield. You know, this big 11 foot diameter. <laughs> big 11 foot diameter, uh, it's created a tremendous drag in flat pitch. So I called the propeller company, of course, told them what was happening, and they came right back and said the aerodynamic forces to make it do that do not exist. <laughs> <laughs> and so they sent an engineer up. <laughs> and by this time, our test pilot knew how to do this every time. <laughs> so he took the engineer for a ride <laughs> and almost put him through the windshield. <laughs> and you know, he disappeared. We never heard from him again. <laughs> so uh, we, we, luckily, there was, there was one like combing with a gear drive. It's uh, this, the one you have now, uh, or, or an earlier one really, it's lower power, but same engine with a .632 gearbox uh, that uh, gives you a reasonable propeller RPM and reasonable propeller performance. So that became uh, uh, the Helio. Uh, there's one other story. Uh, um, you know, these uh, companies like, uh, like Helio, uh, getting the type certificate is the last gasp. They spend their last dollar practically to get it. And uh, we got it through all these static tests and the flutter tests and all the rest of it. And finally had uh, the FAA or CAA engineering test pilots fly it. And they said, the airplane is flying, we'll go along with it, but we think the ailerons are too light. I never saw an airplane with too light ailerons, but uh, they, they wouldn't pass it. And that was important to us, not what we thought about the ailerons. So how in the world do you change the aileron hinge moment without spending any money? You see, the routine way of doing it would be to change the leading edge balance, put more aerodynamic balance on, or, or change the gearing uh, between the aileron and, and, the, uh, and the wheel. Do something expensive. And luckily, luckily, I thought uh, of this idea of a piece of string over the top of the aileron at the trailing edge. And I had somebody go into the storeroom and get a ball of string, and we glued it on right there on the top of the aileron at the trailing edge, right across the aileron. They flew it and said, okay, we'll buy that. Let's make it like that. <laughs> uh, now, of course, we had all kinds of uh, trials and tribulations. Uh, and, and some fun. Uh, one episode, uh, of course, a, a, a company like that uh, needs, uh, call it publicity. And uh, we put on a little show at MIT. Uh, we had a, an athletic field. 
along Massachusetts Avenue, and uh, we're going to fly the uh, two place airplane in and out of there, and uh, invited the, the press to to see it, and. Uh, we were standing around the airplane looking at it, and one of the news photographers said, about where will this thing take off? And I pointed to him, about over there. And he went over and he lay on the ground. <laughs> and when the airplane took off, it's lucky the propeller didn't chop him, <laughs> but the tail wheel did hit him, because that was the last thing off the ground. These people will do anything to get a, a photograph. But <laughs> another thing it did was uh, fly out of the, uh, Tennis courts alongside the Harvard Stadium. Uh, did that without any fuss, and uh, and so on. It was, uh, as far as take pure takeoff is concerned, it was a better performing airplane than the than the four place, uh, but it didn't have the high speed naturally because of the 85 horsepower. Uh, uh, the four place, on the other hand, uh, did some remarkable things. We have a, 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 a road over there, which is like uh, Silicon Valley. It's Route 128, where all the electric, electronic companies are located. And uh, one of our pilots took a four-place helio and landed in the grounds of every, every one of those factories, over the fence and in the grounds of every one, with the idea of selling them an airplane to uh, you know, if you want to go to the airport, for instance, take a jet, why, the way to get over there is with a helio, and so on. But uh, the idea is so fixed in their minds that an airplane belongs at an airport, period. Yeah, that, that same experience before that. Uh, I was working with a group uh, making noise reductions of airplanes, and we uh, rebuilt a, a, a piper so that when we were taking uh, sound measurements, we had to stop taking them when a car went down the road. Mm -hmm. We got the uh, dB count very, very low. And part of the, uh, this was an NA, uh, a CA contract, part of the contract was to, to go out into the community and fly the airplane out of communities. So we did that. We picked the field in, in Dedham, which is a sort of a ritzy uh, community in, in, around Boston, and flew the airplane in and out of there, and uh, had somebody knocking uh, uh, on the door and asking the housewives, uh, does the airplane noise bother them? And said, what airplane? Where is it? Get it out of here. Don't you know an airplane belongs on an airport? Uh, uh, they, uh, it was no use. Uh, there wasn't any way that uh, you could do anything with, with these uh, uh, short takeoff airplanes uh, to get the community to accept them. They're just another airplane. It was the same thing along 128. All the executives said, yeah, it's fine, but an airplane belongs on an airport. One day I was in Youngstown, Ohio, and uh, lo and behold, I saw a helio taxiing in. And that's it, I talked to the pilot. He was the chief pilot of the company kept the helio at the plant, and kept the uh, uh, Learjet at the airport. And they flew the people from the plant to the airport and uh, away in the Lear. And that, that was an ideal operation. Well, I think I pretty well talked myself out. Uh, I'd like to throw it open to Question. questions, yes. Oh, do you want to do that? Uh, oh, wait, I'd like to show the two pictures, please, yeah. Did the job on the ailerons. Could you ask your question again, please? Would you explain how the string, adding of the string and the trailing edge of the aileron did the trick? I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. But I, I, I know that from other people's experiments, yes. But uh, it, it changes the airflow over the trailing edge. Makes it less sensitive? Uh, it makes it heavier. Increases the hinge moment. Increases the force required to uh, move the aileron. Luckily, I knew that trick. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more bankrupt company. The uh, picture was of the proof of concept airplane. Does yes. the prototype still exist? I, I, well, the prototype really doesn't. 
Uh, our test pilot was killed flying it. Uh, he ran into a line squall uh, all near Concord, Massachusetts, and uh, attempting to land, he, he messed it up. Last week, I asked you about the, the down thrust on the engine. Could you explain a little bit again what, what that's all about, what it's for? Yes. Uh, one of the problems with any of these is if you're normally carrying a down load on the tail, uh, the, uh, a change in, uh, in thrust will give you a pitching moment. It's tail heavy, as you pilots know. It's tail heavy when you open the throttle and nose heavy when you close the throttle. <laughs> And in order to reduce that, if you tilt the engine down, of course the original shifting blows upward, so that you, you get, uh, due to the slipstream, uh, a smaller change in angle of attack of that portion of the tail that's in the slipstream. That's, that's what it is, mostly. But it also gets the thrust line higher in relation to the CG. You see, if you tilt it up and the CG is here, the thrust line's higher. And a high thrust line above CG is, is also desirable for the same reason, the power on and off trim. On some airplanes, you know, are dangerous. If you uh, trim for the approach and then have a wave off, they don't have enough elevator control to hold the nose down. The uh, heavy weight that was in the uh, rudder at the top. And the story that was given to us was that the FAA had said you had to have it in there, but you didn't feel it was really necessary. Had, was that true? No. This is uh, conventional. Uh, it's a, a question of flutter. You, you have a, a, a certain moment about the hinge of, of the weight of the rudder. If you laid the airplane on its side, the rudder would flop down. and. Uh, under those uh, conditions, uh, you can uh, excite a flutter of, of the rudder. And uh, in order to uh, avoid that, you move the center of gravity of the rudder itself forward by putting this counterweight on. And, and that, uh, that's the same reason we don't have metal covered ailerons. You see, we'd have to, uh, since the leading edge projection of the aileron ahead of the hinge is very small, we'd have to put a lot of lead along the leading edge to counterbalance the weight, the additional weight of metal on the aileron. So that's the reason it's fabric. Where does the name Helio Courier come from? Not for me. <laughs> <coughs> Could we get back to the 64% of the lift taken up by the slats? Yeah. Um, I didn't quite understand you. You said when the spoilers were up, that was true. No, no, okay. no. No, just two with the, with the slats out. If you just take it and haul it up, you'll get the slats will be carrying 64% of it. It's because you get a lift distribution with a very high peak uh, at the leading edge. So the spoilers are strictly uh, operating with the ailerons. Uh, the interceptors, yes. Interceptors. Yeah. What is Mr. Bollinger doing now, Dr. Uh, Bollinger? The last I heard, he was uh, teaching school at Purdue, but I think he's retired now. Teaching economics or? Yes, business. Hmm. Is there any reason why we have a longer string on the ailerons of a float than we do on the land? No, that's another one of those magic questions. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's probably no good reason. You probably could work them interchangeably. Well, things. they did that, and they found it was too sensitive. Oh. Uh, they felt that way down in Peru. Is that so? We put the ailerons from a land plane on it, and it, it, they felt it was too sensitive. They finally went around to looking at the other ailerons that came yeah. off of the float plane, and they were longer. Now, maybe that's wrong. I don't know, but it worked. Hey. You know, between us, I flew one day before yesterday with uh, Larry Montgomery, had no string on the aileron. And uh, I was disappointed, and I, th I thought the ailerons were too heavy. But, uh, because I'm used to my airplane, which, have, which has no stick force at all. 
you know. Dr. Coppin, why, uh, I understood that it was CAA or FAA that made you put the springs in there in the aileron system up on the uh, control yoke to neutral, to bring the ailerons back to neutral. Uh, can you say anything about why those are there? Uh, I don't remember that. I, I don't believe they required it. Uh, apparently the ailerons in the center for some reason. Uh, we but, took them out yeah, because the it just made extra work. Sure. The other ones had no springs, I know that. Somebody had the idea, probably, that they didn't say Well, the, the feedback to us, probably incorrect, was that uh, the FAA had required that. I, I don't believe that. They require plenty of things, but not that. <laughs> as, uh, as we look at aerodynamic cleanup, I'd like, uh, if you were going to do aerodynamic cleanup, what would you do to make the plane faster? Well, Larry Montgomery asked me that. Well, I told him I'd chop the wings off. <laughs> <laughs> then he said, will that affect the takeoff? <laughs> Have you got any other good ideas? <laughs> Why do you have two sets of interceptors on each wing rather than, say, one, just one set? Is it slots or interceptors? Interceptors. I, I've forgotten it. Uh, probably only for mechanical reasons of some kind. There's no aerodynamic reason for it. Because we fly in Brazil, we had to remove them one time, and we did a test flight with just the, just two of them in, in the wings, and it flew just the same way as it did when we had four of them. We did the same in Peru, and we couldn't tell any difference. We just left two of them off. Oh, we said no, now we left them off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I wondered about the uh, why you didn't use, I suppose it's because you wanted a cleaner airplane, why you used the struts, did not use the struts like the Cessna did, but thereby making the wing a much heavier wing. The plane would have been a lighter airplane without, if it had struts like the Cessna, but perhaps you went that way because you wanted a cleaner wing and fuselage set up. Well, again, it's that uh, basic idea of ratio maximum lift to minimum drag. You want the drag as low as you can get it. You, you are crying for more speed, and that's the way to get it. We could have better f wheel fairings around the, uh, the casting wheel uh, mechanism down there and so on. You could clean it up quite a bit. The early uh, Helios had a uh, maneuvering speed that, uh, that uh, was higher with higher weight, which is contrary to uh, usual aer aerodynamics. Um, um, as I recall, it was the, it's the only airplane I've ever seen that was that way. And I'm not so sure about what has been changed now, I don't know, but was there, was there any particular reason for that, you know? No, I don't even remember that it was so. Uh, well, 30 years is a long time. You said you uh, were working on making an airplane quiet. What were some of the things that you did to make it so quiet that people well, couldn't hear it? Number one, uh, slow the propeller down. Reduce the propeller to tip speed. So that was your primary That was the primary thing. thing. That's a, and of course, mufflers. Uh, you see, if you don't quiet the propeller, it's no use putting a muffler on it because it'll be just as noisy. And if, if you do uh, quiet the propeller and don't uh, muffle it, it'll be just as noisy as before. So you have to do both, which you did. Put maximum silences on it. If you have slowed the propeller to the extent possible and still have the desired performance, and the propeller noise still exceeds the exhaust noise, is there any advantage to having a muffled exhaust? Yes, in that case, yes. If the propeller noise is less than the exhaust, yes. Well, okay, if the, if the propeller noise is still above the exhaust noise, is there any advantage no, to muffler? No, no, no. No, you'll never notice the difference as it flies by. 
You mentioned a while ago that you have your you have a helio that you fly. Oh no, I have a you know, a little yellow Yankee. Okay. Yeah. And they tell me I design the safest airplane and fly the most unsafe. <laughs> <laughs> That's only statistical, though. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, if we uh, could uh, wanted to get a faster airplane, we would chop the wings off. Do you know if there's been any experimentation with uh, uh, retractable wingtips or the wingtips telescope inside uh, inside the wing to get more speed as speed builds up? Yes, they have. There was a French airplane I remember that uh, an experimental airplane that did that. Whether, whether it's, it's, it's not easy, you know. There's a, 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 a high bending moment on it while you're trying to do that. If you land and do it and go up again, it'd be all right. But uh, if you want to do it in flight, it's not easy. It takes a good force to overcome. Were you involved in, with the twin engine helio at all? And, and if you were, can you give us some of the reasons for going to two engines? I, I was not involved, uh, to answer the question first. I don't know, I think there's some sales reason for it. And then one other question about the augmenter tube. Uh, what was the thinking behind the augmenter tube? Was it to muffle the engine, uh, more airspeed, or...? Both. You see, the idea is it takes 2.5% uh, of the power uh, to cool the engine. If you do it, and no matter how you do it, uh, if you do it with, uh, you know, cowl flaps or or open, various openings in the cowling and so on to get the pressure drop necessary to uh, force the cooling air through. And the, the uh, idea behind the uh, ejector was that you use energy which you ordinarily throw away, that is the, uh, the uh, velocity of the exhaust gas. See, like on a fighter, uh, like a Spitfire, you could point the exhaust back and get a considerable speed effect from the jet effect of the exhaust. But with an airplane like Helio, flying at the speeds it flies, you can point it back all you want to it, and it won't do you any good. But uh, you're still expending power to cool the engine, and if you can use that uh, exhaust, the power in that exhaust, to uh, suck the cooling air through it while you're ahead. But I understand it's a maintenance pain in the neck. Mm. But I saw one. Uh, a, f a, few, a couple of months back, that still had the exhaust ejector. The man was very proud of it. It was, it was his third helio, and still had it. Um, I just want to ask the question: Since uh, the helio has slats, I wonder why the w is the wing a slow speed wing or is it a high speed wing well, when the slats are in? I'm sorry. Uh, actually, it's the same wing that the fighters used in World War II, the 23015. Uh, so, uh, to that answer the question. So, why uh, is the speed limited then? Why can't we have a higher speed in cruise <laughs> if it's a fast wing? Well, that's as fast as it is. The thrust equals the drag at that speed, and that's it. Uh, just thinking, comparing to 210, for example, with the same amount of horsepower, we, you know, we get much higher airspeed. And I was thinking, if the wing basically is the same, uh, we should lose it somewhere else than the wing. Well, look, it's impossible to put, uh, I would say, put that garbage on the wing, like uh, you have the gaps around the leading edge slots, uh, slats. You have the, 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 the gaps at the, at the uh, flap. And you know, uh, it's hard to visualize that, but take the, that gap ahead of the flap. Uh, you have a pressure di uh, difference between the bottom and the top. And of course the air obeys that, and, and you get a, a sheet of air out of there. And you might just as well have a spoiler up there. And, and that is one source of drag. I think if I were going to try to reduce the drag of the helio, that is the sort of thing I'd go for, to s try to seal the leak without spoiling the ac action of the, of the uh, slot there, seal that leak, seal the leaks around the leading edge slats and so on. You don't see it, but it's there.
and how you had the uh, the ailerons tied into they were full span ailerons. Um, the problem that you were speaking to was was adverse aileron yaw. That's right. Did you have any differential in the ailerons? Uh, no, equal up and down, but that wouldn't have made any difference. It's awfully hard to prove that differential, which is usually 10 down, 30 up, it does you any good. Really? So then basically you're saying that, that the interceptor is what compensate made that work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's that combination. We had talked about the uh, springs and the aileron system a bit ago. What about in the rudder system? There are good reasons for springs there? Uh, no, no good real reason. Uh, of course, it, uh, even my little airplane has those. It, it adds the rudder sort of to the vertical fin and makes it a better two-control airplane if you want it, a better aileron airplane. But uh, I don't know any good reason to have them there. Dr. Coppin, uh, uh, I've understood that you incorporated a lot of uh, I'm thinking about safety when you designed yeah. the Helio. Yeah. You incorporated a lot of information that I don't know from Cornell or uh, from could Cornell you, was. Uh, could you expound on that a little bit? Yes, uh, there was a doctor at uh, Cornell who was an advocate of making the the cabin safe, and one of the things he uh, uh, favored was uh, a seat which would take uh, 50 G. Said the human body properly supported can stand 50 G, and uh, if you only if you keep, can keep the seat in the airplane and keep the pilot in the seat. And I designed this 50 G seat, and it had, had great uh, uh, shoulder straps. There was a, a cross member back of the seat, and uh, the uh, shoulder straps attached to it, and right down to uh, in the center, and uh, it was marvelous. But uh, sales-wise, uh, you couldn't make it pretty seat. You couldn't make it uh, adjustable. You know the trouble Cessna's having now with uh, lawsuits and so on, with the, the pilot seats taking off either rearward or forward. Uh, but uh, the market simply wouldn't take it. But uh, we fooled them. We, we put this cage around them of uh, chrome molly tubing. You know, the good strong tubes across the windshield and, and up over the top. So that uh, if, if you can stay in it and be restrained in it, you're, you're pretty, pretty well off. And the record has shown that. Now, I understood that uh, you is it true that you designed the gear to shear there below that uh, tube and start absorbing inertia before it got to the cabin? No, you. That's been correct. No, you're giving me too much credit on that one. <laughs> uh, there's one thing, one design point though that I think might be mentioned. Now, of course, the leading edge slats increase the lift of the wing. In fact. If you use a full angle of attack range of the wing with the slats out, you can just about double the lift of a wing, you see. But now you, you can take it one of two ways, either in performance or in uh, safety. Now, I elected to take it in safety. Now, uh, about the highest angle of attack you can get of the plane wing is uh, about 15 degrees with a stick all the way back. But the wing doesn't separate, normally called stalling, uh, to 30 degrees. So you, when you're flying a, a helio, as slow as you can fly it, you have as much angle of attack margin as a normal airplane has at cruise. And uh, I think that's a big safety factor. For instance, remember that uh, uh, DC-10 that went in Chicago, dropped a wing, it dropped an engine and uh, didn't fly around the field, but went in. Well, the Douglas Company elected to use the leading edge slats for performance, you see, and uh, in order to get uh, short field, a uh, shorter field performance for takeoff. So they uh, 
And when the engine dropped off, the airplane should have been able to fly around the field and land easily uh, because they dropped 11,000 pounds and uh, it was lighter. But <laughs> uh, it didn't, remember? It rolled off and in. Well, when the engine dropped off, it, it disturbed the hydraulic system and the, uh, the, uh, the side that was minus the engine, the slats closed. And using the slats for lift now, had so much lift on the right-hand wing that the thing just rolled over and in. And nothing you could do about it. Uh, you could fly it faster, but it didn't have enough room for that. So the, air, the airlines cr uh, cured it overnight. They just had everybody increase the climb out speed of a DC-10 by 10 knots. Uh, 10 knots faster, you could overcome that uh, rolling moment. But uh, the point is you can use them for safety or use them for performance, take your pick. And that might be one way to, if you want, to increase your uh, speed, is chop the wing off and uh, use the slats for uh, performance. Get the same lift that you get now with a smaller wing area, but at a greater risk. I, I wouldn't do it. During the certification process, I'm sure the airplane was spun. Uh, can you tell us how it spins? It doesn't. They tried and tried. They loaded it way aft, tried, nothing doing. They couldn't get a high enough angle of attack. You cannot get it up to 30 degrees. That's angle of attack, not path angle, but angle of attack. Or not attitude angle, rather, but angle of attack. <coughs> it's real high. Well, we've had the, I've had the nose up high enough with a, a slight bit of power to where you will get a break. It will actually fall. But uh, I've never been able to uh, get it into a spin. It just. No, you, you can't. They tried hard here for that. Remember the Curtis Tanninger? Very well. T tell our fellows a little bit about it. Well, that was an early attempt at stall. Uh, that's right. Uh, uh, the, that was the Guggenheim Safe Airplane Competition, and uh, they all of the the leading airplanes uh, were capable of low speed. All the leading a airplanes had leading edge slots and trailing edge flaps. And they were capable, and lighter wing loadings in Helio, they were capable of, of low speeds. But they had no control. They, they had to fly at an obstacle in order to get over. They couldn't turn uh, away from the obstacle. And uh, I think that is Helio's biggest contribution. And the same was true in the uh, German Rundflug. They had a lot of airplanes that would fly as, as slow. But uh, they always flew at the obstacle. They, they never turned, for good reason. Well, Mr. Coffin, uh, you probably, when you were designing this, uh, you were designing an airplane, you probably didn't realize that it'd probably be used for, I've used it many nights, uh, slept many nights in it, out in the jungle. <laughs> In a nice no, office, I didn't a nice bedroom, that. nice kitchen. <laughs> didn't think of that. <laughs> Took a bath on the floats out of it. <laughs> Been a beautiful airplane. It's a good float airplane, isn't it? Very good float airplane. That's the beauty of having wings. <laughs> but, uh, we, we tried uh, down in Peru. We tried the 206 on floats, and uh, you just had to work your heart out to get that one out. But this one, you can just sock the power to it, and in less than a minute. You can haul it out without any problem. Yeah, that's the beauty of having wings. Yeah. Um, Fred, tell the doctor about the wing, the biplane we flew, the biplane, helio biplane. <laughs> we had uh, <clears throat> one uh, accident uh, where the wing was dinged and un unable to repair it to sustain flight. So we uh, <clears throat> back at the center we. Uh, on the floats, we took the wing that we needed out there to fly it out to the other airplane, and we put it on there and put the angle of attack of that wing equal with the angle of attack of the other wing and blocked it there and then tied it on the float. 
and then we made some tests with it and it flew just fine and we flew that wing out there uh, on the floats mm -hmm. out to the other airplane and put it on the airplane and brought the other airplane home. Boy, you're ingenious. <laughs> <laughs> Are you all questioned out? Uh, no. <laughs> what uh, What would be the uh, result of uh, you're talking about uh, sealing the gap between the ailerons or the well the ailerons and the flaps more more specifically the gap between the flaps and the wings? What would be the result if you extended the lower skin of the um, of the wing trailing edge no. uh, back so that the flaps so you seal that gap? No. Uh, you would spoil the, the uh, flap. Uh, it, it depends on that flow between the, the wing and, and the flat leading edge for its maximum lift. As you put an obstruction there, it would just kill it. Now the original Beechcraft uh, had uh, a folding uh, curtain there. Uh, when the flap went down, it folded up against the uh, main portion of the wing. That was a good idea. But they don't have it any longer. Too much maintenance and so on. How effective would it be just to seal the, the top side of the trailing edge against the flap? Well, that, that would, uh, would help fine. That would be a big help as long as it didn't interfere. See, and that wouldn't interfere with the flow. But I'm sure you, you could get some speed out of it by just playing around like that. A little here and a little there. I used to talk with Mr. Sikorsky on the uh, first amphibians. And uh, I asked him, well, how much faster is it now? Oh, it's picked up, I don't know, six knots. Yeah, but we changed this and we changed that and, and so on. And none of them. Uh, any appreciable increase in speed, but in the aggregate, why, yes, a, me a measurable increase.